Welcome to Broadview United, here at the Arbutus site. We're glad that you can join us. We acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Coast Salish people, particularly the Lekwungen, and we give thanks for their stewardship on this land in which we work, play, and worship. So join us as we unfold in this journey toward an understanding of what it means to live in right relationship with all of God's creation. We light this candle today remembering the spirit that blows in our midst, remembering the person of Jesus who is always with us, remembering how he walked with all peoples, how he was an ally and an agitator, and he calls us to do the same. Thanks be to God. Amen. Our reading for the month of June comes from the book of Acts, and we're reading from chapter 16, from verses 16 all the way through to 34. This is the story of Paul and Silas um, as they are making the journey together. One day, as we were going to the place of prayer, we met a slave girl who had a spirit of divination and brought her owners a great deal of money by fortune telling. While she followed Paul and us, she would cry out, These men are slaves of the Most High God who proclaim to you a way of salvation. She kept doing this for many days. But Paul, very much annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I order you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her that very hour. But when her owners saw that their hope of making money was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. When they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are disturbing our city. They are Jews, and they are advocating customs that are not law for us as Romans to adopt or observe. The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates had them stripped of their clothing and ordered them to be beaten with rods. After they had given them a severe flogging, they threw them into prison and ordered the jailer to keep them securely. Following these instructions, the jailer put them in the innermost cell and fastened their feet in stocks. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. Suddenly there was an earthquake, so violent that the foundations of the prison were shaken, and immediately all of the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer woke up and he saw the prison doors wide open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, since he was supposed to be uh, known and not let the prisoners escape. But Paul shouted out in a loud voice, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. The jailer called for lights, and rushing in, he fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they answered, Believe on the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. They spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. At that same hour of the night, he took them and washed their wounds. Then he and his entire family were baptized without delay. He brought them up and into the house and set food before them, and he his entire household rejoiced that they had become a believer in God. Thanks be to God. Amen. The very Reverend Dr. Wilbur Howard was elected moderator of the United Church in 1974. Some of you may remember that Wilbur Howard was a black man thereby having the distinction of being the first black moderator of our denomination. The Broadview magazine recently reissued a story written a few years ago on Dr. Howard. Wilbur graduated in the spring class of 1941 from Emmanuel College in Toronto. 
despite there being a minister shortage, think wartime here, and even with the reality that all the other ministers were being settled into congregations, it would be another 24 years before he received the call to a team ministry with the congregation of Dominion Chalmers in Ottawa. And by this time, he was 53 years of age. I want to quote briefly from that article. A 1974 Globe and Mail editorial about his election as moderator said that Howard had known the face of racism in his ministry. And his appointment was just as noteworthy for that fact as would be the first black federal cabinet minister. The Toronto Star took a similar view, calling his election as moderator a departure from the assumptions of white racial superiority that prevailed not only in Canada, but also among church people. And in its 1974 report on general counsel that year, the Observer magazine wondered how many humiliations had been visited on this brother, for he never let it show, he never complained, and he never talked about it. We can only imagine. I was 13 years old at the time, and as such, you might wonder why I have such vivid memories of Dr. Howard. It's interesting what we remember from our childhood, isn't it? My family had just moved into Regina, and as such, I was dealing with my own stuff of being incredibly put out at having to say goodbye to so many good friends in my previous community. The bigger picture of church and world, quite frankly, wasn't even on the radar. Go figure. I remember Wilbur Howard because on one of his trips to Saskatchewan, traveling across the country, as moderators did, we had the pleasure of his company when he joined us at our dinner table one night. But is that why I remember him? No. We often had folks in for dinner. I remember him because after supper, as I moved back to sit at the kitchen table, Dr. Howard pulled up a chair and helped me with my math homework. Does this mean I didn't notice he was a different color than me? Frankly, I can't imagine that I wouldn't have noticed the color of his skin, for at that time there truly weren't many people in Regina who were black, apart from professional football players. No, the image that is etched in my mind is of a kind, soft-spoken man who noticed me. Obviously, I was struggling on some level, and he responded from his heart. So why am I sharing this story with you? Because I'm hoping that each of you will tap into your own memories of when you first became aware of the variety of races and colors in our world. And here's where it gets a bit difficult for me because I have a much clearer sense of the years which predate the time when I met Wilbur Howard of growing up in Fort Capel, Saskatchewan, amongst the First Nations that belong to Treaty 4, most notably the Pasqua, Standing Buffalo, and Star Blanket First Nations. And even though my parents were extremely open and we had the good fortune to mix in our neighborhood and socialize in the world of after-school play with both white kids and the Métis kids who lived in our neighborhood, there was still a deep and a systemic divide in everything else that we did. I was bused into school to La Brette for grades five and six, and lo and behold, in that same tiny village of La Brette, there was also an Indian residential school, which stood a mere two blocks away from the small public school I attended. And never once in those two years did the two worlds meet each other. No shared school experiences, no joint phys ed or music programs or learning or culture or simply play. And looking back, I realized that not only what a huge missed opportunity this was for me when I was growing up as a white kid, I was all the poorer and yes, more privileged at the same time. More grievous, though, is that during these formative years before I reached the age of 12, like a sponge, I had somehow taken in this false and despicable racist notion that my white skin made me just a little bit better. 
and it's sad. We remember back to the hierarchy of which Mark spoke last week, which exists to this day. And as I contemplate this, I will have regret and anger about this for the rest of my life. But none of us get do-overs, do we? Wilbur Howard certainly did not to get to reclaim those lost years of ministry, 24. Unlike his white classmates who just sallied forth to serve God post-graduation. And we could spend a lot of time unpacking the community of Africville in Nova Scotia, just outside of Halifax. And so despite the fact that in the late 1700s and early 1800s, hundreds of black people, most and of many who had been slaves post-revolution, had come up to Halifax and Nova Scotia with the promise of land. And so they had settled in a community of Africville and then in the 1960s, I believe, that community was dismantled. They were shuttled off. Some of them got money for their homes. Many did not if they couldn't prove that they had the papers. And so yet again, no choice there, no do-over for the folks of Africville. No do-over for thousands of black and indigenous and people of color for the racism the hate, the discrimination, the thousands of microaggressions, the physical, the mental, the sexual, the emotional and spiritual abuse. So many forces and powers and principalities that have robbed so many deaths of folks. And so this is our context today. So we return to our text that Mark just read, this extraordinary story from Acts, which sees Paul and Silas picking up from Troas and sailing further north in the Aegean Sea. They had landed in the city of Philippi in the district of Macedonia, and roughly speaking, this is the area of Greece today. So they're en route to a place of prayer and they are followed by a slave girl who brought them quite a bit of money through a form of fortune telling. She persisted loudly and Paul was frankly quite annoyed, but something in this encounter led to a freedom of sorts for the slave girl. We don't know how it happened, but in that one instance, one person is liberated and then something else has to happen because economic systems have been shattered. It kind of makes me wonder would Paul and Silas have been thrown in prison if they hadn't participated in the liberation of another, i.e. the one who is not free, who is female, who is cast as having something akin to an evil spirit? How often does the freeing of one lead to the clamping down or the oppression of another person, a group, or a race? When and where and how does it ever stop? Or change. As Mark spoke of last week, the focus shifts from the bottom of hierarchy up to the next level. Thus the jailer follows the orders and Paul and Silas are arrested and shackled in prison. Yet even in prison we have this beautiful scene unfolding. The first phase of liberation has already happened with the freeing of the slave girl. And so Paulus, Paul and Silas pray and sing their hearts out, which leads to a metaphorical earthquake, which results in a massive freeing of many prisoners. And yet the jailer, as we talked about last week, would have been on the hook. And so as he prepares to take his life, Paul comes firmly and stands beside him. He says, no, 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 don't do that. We are here with you. They stand together. That's the power when the gospel is unleashed. I'm not going anywhere. I'm going to stand by you. Don't we wish a metaphorical earthquake would dismantle the systems of racism of which there has been so much talk, finally, and so much attention during these last few weeks since the murder of George Floyd at the hands of a Minneapolis police officer while three others stood by and merely watched. Perhaps a metaphorical earthquake is precisely what is occurring now. Time will tell. 
So this gospel, this gospel which Jesus taught and preached and walked and loved and actually turned tables for, it's the same call that took Paul and Silas on their voyage to the Gentiles. It is the same call to which Nelson Mandela and Martin Luther King Jr. and Wilbur Howard and Viola Desmond and Rosa Parks also answered yes to as well as thousands and thousands of other folks. And my friends, this same call comes to us by virtue of being about the work and the work and the ministry of the God of justice and peace and love in 2020. I was one of many thousands who participated in the peace rally for black lives last Sunday afternoon at Centennial Square. Nearly all of us were wearing masks, and when we could, we social distanced. And we actually took back the space. It was quite remarkable. The Facebook invitation said simply this, you don't need to be an activist to speak up for what matters. You don't need to be a protester to speak up for what matters. To speak up, all you need is a voice and the will to be heard. Hear us, black lives matter. The rally was organized by three black women, Vanessa Simon, Asiya Robinson, and Pam Buiza. It began with an extensive opening and welcome by members of the Coast Salish indigenous peoples on whose unceded territory the rally was held. From my perspective, because I can only speak from my perspective, the rally was peaceful, it was emotional, it was educational, it was challenging, it was insightful and powerful in its diversity and call to action. Several black speakers shared their first-hand experiences of what it means to experience racism in Canada. And though the impetus for the rally certainly was connected directly to the events culminating in George Floyd's murder, it was made very clear if you are in denial that racism is not embedded into the fabric of this country, then you are choosing not to see, you are choosing not to hear, and you are choosing not to act. We touched on this last week that there are countless black voices and black perspectives, of course, as there are for any other race, color, or culture. How could it be otherwise? However, at the rally, many of the messages were specifically directed at non-people of color. And these are the, some of the messages that really resonated with me. We don't need or want your guilt. We don't need you to be overwhelmed or paralyzed. We don't need your platitudes, as in things are much worse in the States. That just amounts to another dismissal. We need you to believe that what we say and experience and share is real and true. We need you to acknowledge your white privilege, thereby being real about how you have benefited in untold ways and means from the color of your skin, absolutely through no fault of your own. But this has resulted in a place and means of personal and systemic privilege and opportunity. We're not asking you to feel bad about the color of your skin, but to recognize the truth for what it is. Do not counter with all lives matter. Black lives are in crisis and have been for so long. Until black lives matter, we simply ain't there. Being colorblind is not the goal here. One person said, my black skin is beautiful just as my sister's brown skin is beautiful. One of the speakers says, we don't need allies, we need agitators. And let me tell you, at that moment I saw Jesus, black, beautiful, speaking truth to power with unrestrained passion and incredible reservoirs of love. Interspersed amongst all the speakers were several calls to action, 
and I think it was when they could notice that the crowd was drifting a little bit into maybe being a little too comfortable or complacent. Each call to action came to us that each and every one of us would call out racism whenever we are in a direct place to do so. And I had an opportunity Tuesday when I was visiting my dentist, despite the fact that I could only answer one sentence at a time because she was digging around there. This is where the rally ends and the work begins with each one of us again and again and again. The continued call to be about the hard work and ministry of eradicating racism asks very tough questions from us. We will and should be uncomfortable. And equally, it demands some honest and unequivocal exploring and wrestling as we continue to grapple and find new paths into justice, commitment, and action. So this day, whether you lean towards being an ally or an agitator, or as we will continue to say at Broadview United, or if you fall somewhere in between, may we never grow weary of standing by those who are most in need, speaking truth to power, for surely someone has already stood by us. Amen and amen. I shared with you last week the indictment from one of our regional staff members. Pray, preach, and protest. You've heard some powerful words this day from Margaret around the preaching and the protesting. Now is our time to also pray. Each of us have been touched and felt heavy. As so I was paging through my Facebook feed today, I saw some folks saying, I have to turn off the news just for self-care. And we can feel inundated. But prayer can help us reground ourselves without having to exclude ourselves from the world. So would you join me in prayer? O oh, Holy One, you have created all human beings in your image and likeness. You've stamped each person with unique specialness and all persons bear your image. Through that image, you call us to reflect your goodness, your justice, and love to all the world. Remind us that when we speak out for justice, mercy, and compassion, we are displaying the attributes we find in you and that we are your voice in the world. We offer this day our whole selves to the fight for human dignity and act as an affront to racism. We pledge to look inside ourselves for the places that systemic racism have taken root and to shed light upon our privilege and our pride. Renew in us the desire to learn and to grow that we might be a reflection of the diverse beauty that is you revealed in each one of us. In the world where we have in the past enslaved and dehumanized others, may we treat each person with dignity and respect. In a world where profit is valued more than human life, may we proclaim the priceless worth of each person. In a world where the ugliness of racism and white supremacy is found, may we live lives that show that love conquers all social ills. May we move in this world in peace, being people of good courage, holding fast to that which is good, render to no one evil for evil, strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, and honor everyone. May we stand by each other with grace, love, and fortitude through the challenges ahead of us as we work together to bend the arc of history toward justice. May it be so in our lifetime, 
and in lives of those generations that will come after us. Amen.
As you go into the rest of your day and week, remember that the God of love, the flame of light is within each of us. It calls us to speak light to light and to love unconditionally. May we listen to the lives of our black brothers and sisters, their call to actions, especially when we get most uncomfortable. May we pray, may we preach, may we protest, for that is what the God of love calls us to do. Thanks be to God. Amen.